gin happy hour. So I really appreciate you where is that? and listening, right? Where is it? <laughs> um, so just a little bit of a background before I introduce the panelists. The, the topic today is on privacy and data trust. But given the conference we're in and given that the focus of this area is on defense as well as the diversity of panel we have, we're going to do a little modifying of the theme to talk about privacy and security aspects so that we're fully looking at the issue of trust and data. Um, trying to keep the focus on privacy since that's what we were instructed to do. Um, so first let me just quickly welcome, uh, welcome to our panel Aiden Ryan who is the head of, um, you have to wave Aiden because I'm doing them out of order now, <laughs> head of policy at ANISA, which is the EU Network and Information Security Agency. He has a very long history of involvement in cybersecurity, and as I understand, it was actually uh, on the group that helped to found ANISA, so a deep, um, a deep understanding of regulation in this area. We also have Alonso Bustamante, who uh, is on the special projects team of Cloudflare, very mysterious title, Alonso. I hope you will tell us a little bit about it um, as well. We also have Cosimo Distante with us, who is at the Italian National Research Council. He's involved in AI research there at the Institute of Applied Sciences and Intelligence Systems. Um, and then finally, last but not least, we have Travis LeBlanc, who is a partner at Cooley Law Firm. He also, um, uh, from my perspective, worked, interestingly, worked for the Obama administration um, as the chief enforcer in the Federal Communications Commission. So this is someone who's actually levied privacy fines in the U.S. So I'm going to, um, the chairs intimidate me a little bit getting up here like this, so <laughs> I'm going to stand and ask you guys some questions. Um, I told them to please feel free to talk to each other. Um, I'm not going to direct questions necessarily to one person, so it's up to them to jump in. And what we're going to do is start today with um, the theme of privacy. So privacy is a really big concept, and it's also one that is hugely variable. Um, no two people talk about this in the same way. It varies based on your culture. It varies based on your personal experiences. It varies based on the data in question or the transaction at the moment. So my simple question to the panel is, how do you define privacy, and how can we regulate it or help deal with it if the definitions are so varied? Who wants to start? I will start, okay, thank you. Well, I have my own definition of privacy. Uh, from the ethical point of view, I would say it's uh, the boundaries that define uh, a physical space or data of an individual who owns uh, the physical space and the data who, don't, who doesn't want to disclose. Uh, well, of course, uh, if uh, he has to disclose by law, then he has to do that. But from the ethical point of view, I would define like uh, this kind of boundaries. Thank you. Again, taking a personal perspective of privacy and uh, trying to put a definition on it, I think it is anything and any piece of information that captures who we are, what we do, what we believe, and what we think. So this is a very wide definition that encompasses virtually every aspect of our lives, be it in the real world or be it in the digital world. And for me, privacy is trying to control and know where that information is and what it's being used for. And I, by the way, I'll just say, I think that your, your what we think point is really interesting. I heard um, the CEO of Figleaf, which is a company that works specifically on privacy technology, define privacy in terms of our humanity. So this idea of thought, I think, is really interesting. So I'm Thank you. Um, I'm here representing Cloudflare, and for those of you that might not know Cloudflare, essentially we are a large distributed global network. What we do, you know, in very simple terms, is we're moving data from point A to point B. Um, whether it's you know a new site in Tokyo trying to deliver data to this, you know, to your mobile phone right here, but essentially we're moving point from point A to point B. So for us, privacy essentially is being able to move that data from a source all the way to its user and making sure that that data gets there safely and that there's only two people in that transaction and that everybody who's in between that transaction is actually who they say they are. 
as the final person, I will say that I agree with everyone on this concept of privacy. I think that privacy is something that there is no one definition for. Uh, it is a concept that is not static. It is inherently dynamic. And I think it's important for us to recognize it is always changing. What we think of as being relevant for privacy today is a function of the way that that information is used, the technology that we have available to us, and the societal norms that we all live in. Who would have thought that uh, 10 years ago, the kind of information that one might write in a diary that as only intended for that person might be shared on a social platform to all of our friends? Or moreover, many times we may want to share information through a social media platform only to those people that are connections with us or our friends, and we still consider that private because it's within the domain of people that we control and we've chosen for. And so what I think is important about privacy is to recognize that it is going to be societal, it is going to be individual uh, in nature, and also it is something that is going to change, both today and into the future. So I think that, that change and that churn is interesting, and also this idea of churn is interesting as I give you my next question, which is how do we define security? Do you think about it in the same intangible and kind of movable way? Is it more concrete? Um, can you define security, and can you define it thinking about trust? And um, also to make the question even longer and more complicated, uh, because we're thinking about defense, um, you know, does that change when you're thinking about defense? Well, of course, uh, security uh, is pretty much connected uh, with uh, uh, privacy issues. Uh, in my opinion, uh, breaking uh, uh, privacy domain can impact uh, also in uh, security and uh, um, in a safety environment. I mean, uh, um, I come from uh, uh, the surveillance sector for image processing, for example, and uh, in my opinion, uh, 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 security is pretty much connected uh, to um, an environment that is uh, safe, um, and uh, this can be measured, uh, uh, for example, for uh, with uh, um, anormal uh, behaviors, uh, or for the computer, for example, the entrance of, of uh, unknown uh, uh, threats, for example. Mm -hmm. The first comment that I would make is that I see security as a subset of trust. I think trust encaptures a lot more, and when I talk and think about security, I think about maybe the bits and bytes that are associated with my activity that says who I am and what I am, where this these uh, bits are stored, who controls them, and that they stay in the place they're meant to be s uh, remain, and that it allows us to interact with the online world, with the digital world, in a way that I expect, trust, and um, allowed me to do the business in a way that I want to. Mm -hmm. Any breach of th that situation to me would be a breach of security. Yeah, so, so for me, it's very similar to, to what Aiden said. When you're, when you're thinking about security from the perspective of a, of a giant network, it's all about moving those bits and bytes from point A to point B, as I said. And it's about making sure that they're accessed by the right people and that they're delivered to the right person. Um, or, or entity, so it's about letting the right people into, or the right entities into a corporate data center. It's about authenticating the right users into the right corporate application, or it's about letting the right uh, people and information into your mobile phone. So uh, that's a big part of how we see the world. Okay. We often have a conversation about what is the relationship between privacy and security. Um, there is no doubt that you can have security without privacy, but I don't think you can have privacy without security. And what I mean by that is inherent in the concept of privacy is a notion of confidentiality, is a notion of control. It is a notion that the information is contained. And so while privacy is a subset 
of security, right? You can think of lots of security issues that come up where it doesn't involve privacy um, at all. For example, um, losing uh, a laptop that did not have anyone's personal data on it, right? That's a security issue, but it's not really a privacy issue. And I agree with uh, Aiden, I think, who said that above that all is trust. And trust to me is more of a fiduciary recognition. It is a recognition that as an organization, we are responsible for representing the interests and protecting the interests of our customers or those that share that data with us, the data subjects. And so there's no doubt that all three are connected. Um, and you know, if individuals, data subjects, consumers were to know that the personal data that they were sharing with an organization would not be respected, that their choices would not be honored, then I assure you there wouldn't be no question about, there would be serious questions about trust, even though you might secure that data. It's trust that goes one step higher than what the law may say, and ultimately instills in the individuals that share data with you that they should continue to share that data and know that their choices will be honored. Okay, I think, I, do you wanna say something? Yes, I uh, just wanted to add something. So anyone uh, wants to live in a secure place. So I just uh, uh, want, and of course, uh, uh, I, I consider, for example, the lots of uh, video surveillance cameras that uh, all over the, uh, the streets that take uh, our uh, private uh, information related to face or other kind of uh, information related to uh, our habits. So the question is, um, can we give up some uh, privacy in return of a greater security? I think that's a great question for the um, for the panel. Sorry, guys, <laughs> and also for um, the topic that we're under. Is there a, tra a trade off of, of privacy and security? And then I'm going to give you some statistics on trust. We're going to come back to the trust question. So, mm -hmm. sure, um, it's a very good question about what is that trade off between privacy and security, and it's a tough question that every individual, every organization, and even governments have to balance. What a lot of people forget is that a lot of the same personal data that a corporation may want to have, an individual may want to store with an organization so that they can use it, right? You may want to use Gmail, for example, so you're willing to share a lot of information with Google, and then Google will use that may potentially to monetize that data. And then on the back side, law enforcement may also want access to that same exact data that you're sharing, and hackers may want access to that same exact data. And so you have what I think of as like this four-legged stool of the bad actors, of law enforcement, of individuals and consumers, and the company all wanting the exact same information. And for that stool to stand up, it has to have a certain balance that is there. And so the question we ask ourselves is, how much of our privacy are we willing to give up for more security? And that was an easy conversation to have in a world where, in a, in a, in a digital world, where most of us use our electronic devices primarily for entertainment or to make our lives more convenient, right? To make restaurant reservations, you know, on demand or to make airline reservations. But we are moving into a connected world now where the devices that are collecting and storing information about us may have real impacts on our lives here. Example, connected cars or connected medical devices that are in us. So they're collecting all this information and that's, that is one thing. But if those devices are not secure, then lives really are at risk. And so we now find ourselves in a world where it may be important to sacrifice a little more security because what's at risk is not just that someone somewhere is going to find out information about us, but that someone somewhere is going to use that information to try to physically harm us. And there's a point at which we may want to ensure that there is, so, you know, that, that security itself is sacrificed a little bit for the promotion of health, safety, and welfare of the general population. 
expanding a little bit on uh, Travis's comment about privacy and security. Sometimes they're on the same page, sometimes they're on different pages. And if we look at where the interests compete, we look to our governments, our legislatures, uh, we look to the courts to sometimes balance these mm -hmm. competing rights. Yeah. But aside from that, what makes the whole issue very challenging is we have one global network which we are all connected to and we're all living under the same rules. But the cultural aspect differs in different parts of the world. So what is accepted as security in one part of the world may not be accepted in another part. And this adds another layer of challenge to the debate. One thing that I, that I, I want to add from, let's say, the the corporate sector from the technology company sector, it's, it's very important that this debate and all the information that's related to it be put in front of the consumer. The consumer needs to understand and know what's happening with their data from, a, from the point of view of who they're handing it over to. So from a company standpoint, it's very important for us to be transparent with consumers as to what data we're collecting and more importantly, what we're doing with it. Once, I mean, that trade-off also has to be in the consumer's hand. I mean, I can, I can think of an example of a VPN a couple of years ago that uh, VPNs are generally used for consumer privacy and protection on their mobile phones, on their devices, and th it was delivering that, but at the same time, it was selling off your excess bandwidth to um, do bot attacks. Okay. So it's very important for consumers to understand that and say, hey, I'm actually willing to make that trade-off, or maybe I'm not. So okay. that's an important part of the discussion. I think that's, that's very interesting, and you all have you've all talked about trade-offs and you've also all talked about them in terms of who are responsible actors. And I've heard consumers, you know, responsible, they have to do a little self-help. I've heard companies be responsible. I've heard governments should be responsible. So um, that I think pivots us to the trust question. I'm gonna read you guys some statistics. So um, Edelman does something called a trust barometer. They say across the world, this is from 2018, across the world, trust in technology declined among the informed public. I, I don't know who the informed public is, but it's the informed public here. From the US, it dropped 19 points. To in Hong Kong, it dropped 14 points. In Germany, it dropped nine points. And mind you, that's around the time of GDPR. In France, it dropped 18 points, all overall showing a drop in 16 of 28 markets surveyed for trust in technology. At the same time, um, they say that tech is not actively building trust, whether it is heightening concerns over how consumer data is handled, minus 18 points, or increased doubt as to whether tech companies are adequately transparent in how they operate, minus 15 points, technology is trending downwards in key behaviors. The other interesting thing is that Edelman looks at trust in government. So one of the entities that we turn to to help in this process. And there they say one third of Americans now, tr uh, now trust their government uh, less than they did the year before, 14 percentage points down. And according to the OECD, only 38% of people in OECD countries say they trust their governments. So there's a disconnect between citizens and their elected representatives. So how did we, I think there's a, a big question, how did we get to this trust deficit and what can we do to fix it? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll kick off. The statistics, I haven't seen them before, but they're not surprising. Um, again, I, just because you say the trust in Germany goes down X percent, because the network is ubiquitous, I don't think it necessarily reflects on any activity in that particular country. But how often have we picked up the newspapers or turned on the radio, television, or gone online to look at news items where we have seen the latest breach? These breaches have been hotels, they've been social media, and the scales have been huge. We've been talking about millions. It's, it's not just uh, small breaches. And it raises the question then, is your credit card safe? Should I change it? Do I need to change passwords? And we often get emails saying, please change your password uh, just in case. But it's the scale and the frequency of these large compromises. And while the incidents I have given have not been maybe particularly serious, we have seen examples, um, I think, in California of medical records uh, being released. And of course, that 
touches everybody, nobody would want their medical records to be right. uh, released. And uh, these type of stories carry a lot of weight and the building of trust takes time. So it's, it is the breaches, it's kind of the nature of technology and this, this churn where we're constantly being challenged. That's one aspect. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Uh, I think that that is, I definitely agree that that is one concern. I think what I heard from those statistics as well were not just that it is trust in tech that is uh, uh, on the downturn, it's also that it's trust in governments. Um, and I suspect that it's also just trust in institutions. Uh, we are living at a time where we are bombarded by information, bombarded by massive amounts of information. And we know that a lot of that information is not true. If you just listen to the last couple sessions before us about misinformation campaigns, it is obvious that it is that there are individuals and nation states and organizations that are dead set on injecting malicious, deceptive information into the stream of, uh, of, of information that we are all reviewing. And when you're in this world where you can't distinguish between what's true and what's not true, it becomes very difficult to know what you should put your trust in. And I think that's where we are these days is that the, the amount of information that most people consume on social media and particularly and through the internet, those are like the two primary ways that a lot of people are developing information at a time when we're also learning that you can kind of choose your own adventure through the internet um, and you can go down these rabbit holes <laughs> very quickly of like finding and searching for misinformation and suddenly beginning to conclude this must be true if it's on Google, um, you know, or, you know, if my friends, all these friends that I've made and connected with on a social media platform, only about five of whom I actually know, the other 100 have just sent me messages and I, I thought they were cute or I thought they knew someone that I knew and I connected with them and then they start posting um, information and we start to believe it until we realize that it's not true. And I think, so for me, the reason why I think there's so much of a lack of trust is that we, the, the, the source of data that so many of us consume is not curated by a source that is trustful. Mm -hmm. And so until we start at the platforms and others start to put together ways for us to begin to look through information, know what is trustworthy and what is not, I think you're gonna continue to see trust go down. Okay, do you, um, Al Alonso, I'm, I'm interested in hearing from you not only in the reasons why, but also how do you recapture it? Because obviously, you know, it's not only important for institutions and democracy, it's also important from a, um, a business perspective, right? If, you're, if you don't have the trust of consumers, they're gonna go look elsewhere or they're just gonna be unhappy. So I, I think the flip side of those stats is that there's increased interest from the public and from consumers in privacy and protection. I, I know you and I were talking about it last <laughs> week, uh, discussed that we were watching the, uh, the latest Game of Thrones episode, and there was an Apple ad where the entire branding was around yes. being a privacy first yes. brand, which is pretty interesting that the largest consumer electronics brand in the world is pitching their privacy aspect. So the only, way, the only reason you do this is if you see increased readings that your, your consumers are interested in this. From, from our perspective, we also see that increased consumer interest in, in privacy, in trust, um, you know, the decreasing trust in governments, decreasing trust in technology companies. A means that, you know, as technology companies, like I mentioned before, we need to be very, very transparent in, as to what we do with data. But we also need to provide some solutions for consumers. So in our case, we recently, last April, we launched a uh, privacy first uh, mobile app. It was the first time that we sold, or actually that we gave away for free a consumer application uh, through, a, through the iOS and Google Play stores. And the uptake was tremendous. In the first month, we had a million downloads alone. Um, for a company that was used to selling or offering services for free in the B2B space, mm -hmm. moving into the consumer segment and seeing that tremendous uptick was just very Im impressive for us. We, this April, we launched another product that's related. It's basically a VPN replacement. And again, the uptake has been tremendous. So we are seeing a lot of interest from the consumer side for technology-focused solutions so that they can you know, take security and privacy into their own hands. That's very exciting to me to hear that and reassuring in a way because we saw a, a presentation on the big stage earlier today where what, um, I think it was the 
IBM asserted that uh, the that when you're developing technology for consumers, you have to um, assume that, that actors will always choose the simplest solution. And the simplest solution sometimes is to do nothing or to sit passively. So very exciting and reassuring to hear people engaging. Do you wanna, do you wanna say anything about this before we move to another topic? Uh, well, uh, as uh, Travis uh, said before, regarding uh, the correctness the, um, uh, of the information that is delivered, uh, I just wanted uh, also to point out the, the problem of the fake news. So um, the, there is uh, the need to uh, understand and detect uh, um, uh, incorrect information that is uh, delivered. And now today, uh, technology can uh, unfortunately produce um, uh, fake news like, uh, for example, uh, uh, the bad AI uh, uh, can uh, um, um, build, uh, for example, uh, a short uh, uh, movie that uh, allows uh, a popular person, a politician, for example, to say something that has never said uh, before. And this is... Uh, uh, poses uh, uh, very uh, important questions on uh, detecting and measuring the correctness of uh, the data that is uh, that are delivered bo delivered uh, on the network. Yeah, so you were telling me about this earlier, the Obama picture where the facial right. mimicking was so um, right. so well done that it ap actually appeared that he was saying these things. Yes. So maybe this is a good um, segue to. Uh, to go to our, our artificial intelligence, which is some of the, um, we were talking about this a little bit a little bit earlier, and um, Cosimo, you in particular work on um, artificial intelligence having to do with facial recognition. So this is a very sensitive topic in a lot of countries for different reasons. There's concerns about bias, there's concerns about prejudice that may be built into systems, but um, one of the one of the issues we talked about is the role of facial recognition in defense issues or customs and border control and terrorism. And you were talking to me about some of the challenges you face as a researcher with regulation. Yeah, the challenge is uh, uh, building uh, all intelligent uh, systems that are able to prevent or detect uh, on time uh, critical uh, uh, situations. Uh, and this poses uh, a very important uh, implication on privacy because uh, when we talk about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we now are uh, ready to, um, uh, for example, detect uh, uh, fighting on, on, on the streets uh, or other kind of uh, illegal loitering or other kind of uh, illegal uh, behaviors. But to, to do that, we need to collect uh, lots of data because uh, as uh, the world uh, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, has gone uh, a breakthrough in uh, 2012 because uh, the um, accuracy of uh, the system in uh, detecting and recognizing uh, uh, faces or uh, be, uh, be human behaviors or other kind of uh, uh, things related to pattern recognition uh, has received uh, a great interest because of the highest accuracy of uh, this system because it's um, essentially a system that uh, behaves like uh, a human uh, intelligence, mimic the human intelligence. And this thanks also to the uh, new products uh, uh, that have been put on the market uh, uh, that allows to, to do very complex uh, uh, computations. So for to, to build this system, to train this uh, uh, system, there is a need to, to collect uh, and to annotate uh, lots of data. And uh, uh, in my field, uh, which is uh, computer vision, uh, of course we deal with uh, uh, images where uh, uh, private data are uh, in the images and uh, this uh, poses uh, lots of uh, uh, privacy issues. Uh, we must say that um, uh, the more data we provide to the machine, the better the machine 
uh, behave, the better accurate uh, will be the machine. And this can be uh, taught also in the uh, health sector, because the more data we give to the, uh, to the system, the, uh, the more accurate, for example, in diagnosis, uh, 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 in the diagnosis uh, uh, is uh, will uh, will perform uh, the system and for face recognition in before we recognize the face we need to detect the face and to build the system that detects the face uh, that means that we need to collect uh, uh, faces so do any of the rest of you go ahead please comment on that and i think this kind of takes us back to our earlier question which what is the what's the trade off right between privacy and security because this is a product, you know, potentially that assists with security and also then from a competitive, you know, national security defensive issue, we can talk about the relationship with China and so. Um, artificial intelligence, from my perspective, is relatively new. We're still coming to grips with what these algorithms can do and the security associated with them. If we look at a straightforward algorithm uh, in the non-AI world, it's a linear relationship. If you have data in, it's processed, you have data out. In the machine learning world of artificial intelligence, it's much more complex. The process, the algorithm is non-linear, and the whole predictability of what's coming out is more complex, mm -hmm. and also the cybersecurity uh, vulnerability uh, landscape is much bigger in terms of compromising the data coming in and of course with the data coming out. So there's a lot of extra challenges. The debate is maturing but certainly hasn't matured enough to deal with these type of issues. Similarly, your life has probably got a little bit more complex with the GDPR. Uh, other countries not affected by GDPR may see this as a commercial advantage but there could be technical solutions in terms of data anonymization for health records or our faces that just because we have GDPR, I don't think the door is shut. I think there's a way to work with the data protection authorities to try and achieve the compromise which you need. Uh, in all our cities today, we still have cameras that are used by law enforcement uh, for, for, for public control. They haven't been switched off with GDPR. Um, I think there's a way of working around this particular case. It's just going to take a little bit of time. Just to take the, the image recognition example again, I mean, we, we work with a lot of uh, consumer companies, consumer hardware electronics, uh, IoT companies, just to throw another buzzword in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and actually, we, we talk to our customers and we see a lot of pull from hardware companies that have connected devices. And you know, some of us might have a connected doorbell in our houses. Some of us might have a connected camera. The logical next step is that a company is going to link those two. And you could potentially not only, not only see who's at your door, but recognize if it is somebody that's trusted, feed the information into the lock, and open the door for it. Mm -hmm. So I think from the consumer perspective, there's also some pull to start doing this. And we're going to see more and more from, the, from, um, from consumer companies. So there is a pull from consumers to do some things like that. So it's also important to throw these consumer hardware electronics companies into the conversation. So you could, in that case, you're saying that consumer is going to demand it and the consumer will provide consent for the development of the technology. Okay, I'm going to come back to Cosimo after Travis then to talk about consent. But let, let's see what Travis has to say first. Yeah. Uh, as <laughs> citizens, we all entrust national security, law enforcement, public safety professionals to decide that balance between privacy and security. The technology that COSIMO works on, facial recognition technology to be used for national security or law enforcement purposes to uh, stop a terrorist in an airport or from crossing a border, for example, um, we can have a big debate about where you draw the line there. But one issue that I think we should highlight is where that data came from. And I think as we begin to think about where we draw that line, we also have to remember, where did this data come from? From whom was it collected? And when it was collected, what did that individual think that they were consenting to when they provided that information? Who in law enforcement, if it's gonna be in law enforcement, is now going to get access to this database? And what are they going to do with it? And who gets to decide, you know, should, a law enforcement officer 
one individual be able to decide when to use this data and how to use it and whom to target with it? Or do we want a neutral individual in the middle, a judge, for example, that's there? Do we want a law written that specifically says when you can do this and when you can't? And so I think while this technology has the possibility, facial recognition technology, other biometric technology, has the possibility of making us all more secure and ensuring that we have a safer society, I think we also want to make sure that we have a set of rules that are built behind it that balance the privacy and civil liberty interests with the security interests and also ensure that when that balance leans in favor of security, it's limited for the purpose for which, uh, for a, a particular narrow purpose, and that there is some kind of oversight of the government agency as well. Yeah, well, when uh, we talk about face, uh, uh, rec face facial rec recognition, uh, we don't have to think only to uh, law enforcement use. There are many other sectors where facial recognition is uh, can be uh, used, for example, in the retail, physical retail sector. Because today, with phases, uh, we need uh, to measure, for example, the engagement of the person with a product space. And we know that online selling is uh, beating the uh, physical store because the physical store doesn't have proof of performance. Uh, they are not able uh, to uh, measure what the app on the online store measures with the interaction uh, with the, 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 uh, the consumer. And in that case, face analysis is important, not only the face recognition part, but also to understand who is looking, if it's male or female or the age, how much time is uh, watching the, a particular product, and eventually, um, uh, what is the journey that has uh, done a person inside the store, which means uh, detect, uh, getting biometric information in order to allow the match. So now the issue is you are taking uh, biometric information without uh, uh, um, informed consent, or eventually you have to ask for consent, and there are places where there are lots of people that is difficult to get informed consent. It's very costly. Um, provided the fact that the biometric information that uh, is uh, being extracted, it's difficult to be re-identified. So that means from the information I extract from the face, even if the image is uh, uh, deleted immediately, the bunch of information, which is a vector, numerical vector, from that numerical vector, am I able to re-identify the person? If I'm not able to re-identify re the person, that I don't incur in uh, privacy issues. Uh, but mm, today, the GDPR uh, regulation doesn't allow me to grab uh, this biometric information, even if uh, I cannot re-identify the, 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 the person. So th and in fact, the GDPR for, uh, for us, in our um, not in the research sector, but in the industry sector, for those startups who want to uh, b uh, um, build new uh, products based on AI technologies, they are struggling with uh, uh, the regulations. Okay, so there may be some competitive issues here for European researchers, is what you're saying. Yes. Does anybody know? Okay, so I think we'll, um, let's pivot a little bit then. Um, to um, Aiden, a conversation you and you and I had about the fact that a lot of the solutions that we're developing around privacy and security were kind of conceived in the the, the world of internet-based um, companies and internet-based technology. But actually, there's a lot of computer systems that are networked without using um, computers these days, or we have IoT devices. 5G is evolving. So tell me a little bit about um, emerging privacy and security threats you see and the types of solutions that might exist. Uh, from a telecoms perspective, uh, we see data transformation and business transformation uh, taking place with the greater use of the cloud. Um, we see Internet of Things producing a huge amount of data. And um, if I go back a number of years to uh, the early 2000s, 
one of the surprising events was that there was transatlantic fiber cable companies that were going bust. Um, there was no envisaged market, and those people who were maybe just a little bit ahead of their time uh, didn't see and wasn't, weren't able to justify the finance to keep those circuits going. Today, we have many operators putting a huge investment in transatlantic fiber cables and cables going across various continents because we see the level of data growing. Now, while it's difficult to capture the amount of data that's going into cloud uh, providers, the number of cloud providers is increasing rapidly, and an indication of their success is the energy that they're using. And in Europe at the moment, four to six percent of the total energy use of the market is uh, now being attributed uh, to, to cloud. So this is reflecting the level four of data. Four percent? Four percent. Of the total market? Of the total wow. market. Um, and it seems to be increasing. So uh, we see there's a huge amount of data uh, being generated by uh, devices. How this data is handled is changing slightly. Some of it is going via the internet, of course, and there's models, business models being developed to try and limit the data that's transferring to keep it as local as possible. And we have interconnections between cloud providers and major uh, data users that don't use the internet. So these would be uh, private circuits that would be more secure. They'd be just based on the telecoms network and they would uh, have much more restrictive access and better security. So there's different models for handling data. The data is growing. Uh, the role of the internet in connectivity is there, but there's also other options, uh, particularly into cloud and big users, and this needs to be balanced from a security perspective. Okay. okay. I'll add one additional concern that I think is an emerging one and is a huge one, which is the internet of things and security. Um, we just heard a speaker, I think it was Eric, say that he had 65 connected devices at home. Uh, in short order, we're gonna have 25 billion it connected devices around the world, all connecting to networks, and for the most part, being able to move across borders and connect to a network in another country. And many of us will have a lot of these devices and never update the software on them. Yes, we update our software on our phone, but when's the last time you updated the software on your thermostat? or updated the software on your connected toaster? Or what if you had a connected robot, say Anki, and the company goes out of business, and now there's no ability to update the software anymore, yet those devices are still connected to networks and can be used for bots and other things. So I think one of the greatest risks we face is finally figuring out how we're going to secure the Internet of Things. Okay. And I'm sorry, and just as the network company here? Yeah, please do. That leads, <laughs> that, that leads to a very interesting question of where you secure the device. If it's on the hardware itself, or if you have to move the security elsewhere, for example, the network. Okay, so last question. We only have two minutes left. Um, I'm gonna ask you all, are things going to get better or worse with respect to data and trust issues? And you can specify if you want your answers with respect to privacy or security or just trust generally. but. Better, better or worse over the next five years? Well, I think uh, that uh, there will be an improvement uh, of uh, these systems. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, I hope that uh, the GDPR regulation will uh, revise uh, its uh, limitations uh, uh, because, of course, it's uh, an issue for the uh, European uh, startups. Uh, I'm closing. I would like to thank uh, the Italian uh, trade agency and the Italian uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, in Bulgaria. Okay, so you have hope for better. <laughs> I'm an optimist. <laughs> I think uh, where GDPR was once seen as a burden, I think it has changed culture. Mm -hmm. They say culture eats strategy for breakfast. I think the strategies have changed. People are now taking this whole area more seriously. If you look to the uh, future in the mobile world, we see the fifth generation mobile coming down the road. Security is, is increased considerably in this network. It has been designed for higher performance to address Internet of Things, address uh, bulk transport in a much more efficient and safer way, and I think overall things will improve. Okay.
you guys. I'm with Aiden. 15 seconds. What did you say? I said, I'm with Aiden. Very I agree with Aiden. Better. Hopeful. And, and I'll keep it quick. <laughs>